Well, uh, thanks again to the organizers for organizing this wonderful conference in uh, this very special location. And indeed, I'm going to talk about recent progress in uh, experimental quantum computing. So first of all, uh, let me acknowledge the, our group, our quantum computing group at Google. It's a fairly large group, as you can tell, and it has been growing. And the reason why we have such a large group is because we're building a quantum computer. And I mean quantum computer in the you know, standard sense of computers. Uh, so eventually, they will be like actually software engineers running quantum computers, we hope. And that means we need error correction. Uh, you know, uh, I think quantum simulators are, are great. And, and the experimental quantum processors that we have now are amazing. And we can do a lot of science in the meantime. And there is nothing wrong with that. But our final goal is to actually you know, to build a quantum computer. So we need error correction. So it's going to take a while and a lot of people. Uh, more or less there. On the top corner on the right, you get an idea of how complicated we think this machine is going to be. Uh, so we're not going to get there on what go on, on just one go. So we have several milestones to get there. We actually already achieved our what we you know announced were our first two milestones, and that's what I'm uh, going to be talking about. Uh, mostly about the first milestone, uh, a little bit the second milestone, a logical qubit prototype, and our next milestone we we hope to achieve that around 2025. That's a long-lived logical qubit. There was actually a question: What do you mean by the logical qubit? So our definition will be doing around a million cycles of syndrome extraction with a logical error rate per cycle of like, o, o, around 10 to the minus 10. So that's what we need uh, in our case. OK, so, so the first thing, the first milestone, uh, is uh, we call it a beyond classical or classical intractable computation, or uh, you know we used to call it quantum supremacy. Actually, John already explained it, and, and uh, Magic referred to that as well. Uh, so this is our recent update on that milestone, if you want. And the idea is very simple. We're going to just run a quantum circuit. And then we are going to check how well we can sample the output. Uh, so that's all. Um, so it's just that you know the first test that you're on the process to actually trying to build a quantum computer. We start with this because it's simpler than error correction. Yeah. Right. So, and the good thing about it, as you emphasized, is that uh, this uh, allows you to measure the fidelity of the whole system. And it's very important for system engineering. So that's why we choose this as, as the first milestone. Um, so, so that's how the quantum circuit looks like. The single qubit gates are random. The two qubit gates are ISWAP-like. That's kind of important because they are very fast entangling gates. Uh, so we choose the quantum circuits. And this is important if you then want to actually put numbers into this, which we will. Uh, you know, It's important that uh, the, the circuit has this particular gate. Like the single qubit gates are random, but the, the two qubit gates are entangling as fast as we can. Uh, so for numbers, that's important. OK, so then we redid the experiment, you know, like John covered the 2019 version. And, and um, uh, this is the new version. It was uh, put in the archive in April. Um, and there were another two experiments, actually, from USDC, the uh, two Johnson experiments as well, that you see there in the inset. So what we do is the exact, well, here, we're, this was with 70 qubits. Uh, so the x-axis is the depth of the random quantum circuit. And the y-axis is the fidelity. Estimated with cross entropy benchmarking. So, again, that's a good thing of using these random quantum circuits or any random quantum circuit, not this one in particular. If it's random enough, you can use cross entropy to estimate the fidelity. So, that's nice because it allows you, as I was saying, it's, you know, it's a full system uh, fidelity. So, it allows you to do like system engineering. Everything has to be working more or less okay, otherwise, this won't work. And then, as, as John mentioned yesterday, the continuous lines here. That's the discrete error model. So that means you do individual measurements or what are your errors for qubit gates, even qubit gates, measurement and everything else. And ideally, you know, if you multiply the probability of not having an error in any one of these components, that should be the probability of not having an error on the whole system. And if, if that works, uh, if the continuous line kind of follows the uh, you know, dots, which are experimental measurements, then that's great. You, know, you have kind of crosstalk sufficiently under control, at least, to do this experiment. So this was done with 70 qubits. 2019 was uh, 53 qubits, and you know more depth. So we have like 60% more gates with similar fidelity than 2017. Uh, one thing that was interesting is when we do these experiments, like we did in 2017, uh, we cannot check the full fidelity of the whole system, actually. Uh, so what we do is we take data for the whole system, but then we actually break it into like two patches or three patches. So we just remove gates between two subsystems, let's say. We can check the fidelity of the subsystems. And then we just assume, you know, and we did a lot more checks in 2019. By now, we just assume that multiplying the fidelities of the two systems 
gives you the fidelity of the whole system. And one nice thing is that people were eventually, because the classical algorithms have indeed improved, people were eventually able to check the fidelity of the 2018 experiment. So we put the data out, and three years later, somebody was able to check that, yes, we were correct, and everything worked as expected. So that was a great confirmation in our view. OK, so um, I was talking about fidelity. That's important. This is kind of a methodology experiment, and it's a, or a benchmark. And it's a benchmark in two senses. One is the fidelity of the whole system that I was mentioning. Another interesting point of this particular benchmark is, is, is a benchmark also of the computational cost. Like, what is the equivalent classical computational cost? Which we want to make it large enough so that you cannot reproduce it with a classical supercomputer. And that's what we call it, you know, beyond classical or intractable or supremacy. And that's a little bit where more controversialized, like nobody complains about measuring the fidelity anymore. Uh, or at least, well, I'll talk about that. Anyway, so um, here is uh, data from the latest experiment, which you can see on the archive. Um, the first column is actually not that controversial anymore either. So the first column is just the number of flops that you will need to calculate a single amplitude. And there's actually a formal definition for this, because in the case of the, a, a circuit with discrete gates, because gates are tensors. And at least mathematically, you can just say, oh, all my gets are tensors. And calculating one amplitude is contracting the tensors. And then you just want to know what's the minimum cost of contracting the tensors. So at least there is a mathematical definition, which we were talking about in 2017. The problem is we didn't know how to find the minimum. And that was, that's one of the things that has improved great, greatly in this paper from 2020 by uh, Gray and Curtis, um, where they actually made a huge amount of progress on finding out you know, how to find the minimum of tensor contraction. And it has improved a little bit since then, like maybe 20% or something. But that's kind of a stable. So the inset that I was saying before, where you have on the x-axis years and on the, the y-axis is the log of the log of this number, the hardness. And the reason why we do that is because there is, if you want a conjecture that in the long term, we call it Nevin's law, uh, the, this number, the hardness, will increase as a double exponent. So that's why we plot it like this. Of course, this is not a confirmation of a double exponential. This is just to say, well, you know, there is a this suggestion that, that it's a scale this way. We will see eventually if it does. Um, now, uh, the part that is a bit harder is once we have this, you know, kind of more formal definition, just contract tensor, which if you want is flops, assuming like infinite bandwidth and infinite memory and things like that. That's not a real, you know, computational cost with units. For that, you need to find out you know, what you can do in an actual computer. So we take as a reference what is now the largest supercomputer in the world, uh, which is Frontier. And now you have to take into account like distributing in the computation and bandwidth and things like that. So we have also learned uh, through many papers uh, over the years how to do this better. So these are you know, sort of the latest numbers with the latest algorithms. Uh, this is also you know, improving less lately uh, for different reasons. And anyway, the point is that this latest experiment will be around 47 years uh, if you, you know, somebody tried to run it. And this is already a little bit optimistic. OK, so how were we able to run um, this experiment you know, with more qubits and more gates? Well, of course, it's because we improved the single component error. So here you see the single qubit gate improved by a factor of 30%, more or less, the two qubit gate, but a little bit more than that. And the readout improved by quite a bit, two thirds. So we made a lot of improvement readout, or actually, if you want, in 2019, the readout was great in that particular experiment. Good. Uh, so that's uh, more or less the benchmarking of that experiment, which is kind of the main point why, why we keep running it. We want to you know, keep seeing that actually our technology improves. Uh, but in this paper that we put out in, in April, we actually study more uh, kind of the physics behind this random circuit sampling experiment. And the idea is the following. Uh, there is a competition between um, this fast and stangling random circuit. With, with, what we're trying to do is create a globally entangled state, like global correlations. Uh, so it's a competition between the entangling, right, which we do as fast as we can, and the noise. You know, there is noise. This is an experimental process, uh, uh, which kind of breaks global correlations, breaks entanglement, and maybe local correlations will survive and not global correlations. So actually, noise drives the system. So the, the mixed state and the random circuit entangling gates and trying to create entangled, entanglement as fast as possible. So here we have this competition between these two uh, you know, tendencies. So it turns out that if you actually uh, check the fidelity, the fidelity is sort of the product of the component's fidelity is when things go well. Um, 
and, and, and you, you, you do cross-centric benchmarking and you divide these two regions. I was saying that cross-centric benchmarking is an estimate of fidelity, but it's only an estimate of fidelity for low enough uh, global errors. Where error here, you need to measure by error per layer. So what you have on the x-axis is the error per layer, and the y-axis is this order parameter, the fidelity divided by the cross-entropy. And you see that as you increase the depth, this is in 1D, a random gates because it's easy to simulate. Um, anyway, so the point is that on the left, as you increase the depth um, or lower the error, uh, this ratio goes to one, but on the right of some transition point, uh, the ratio goes to zero, meaning uh, fidelity decreases much faster than cross entropy benchmarking. This has to do with noise destroying global correlations, but there might be small local correlations that remain for longer, and that's why uh, you have this phase transition. You can actually map this transition to a classical icing-like model, um, so it's a proper phase transition. And what happens is on the weak noise regime, uh, well, then the fidelity is a good estimate of cross entropy. You have global correlations, and for reasons that I don't have time to discuss, uh, this, the system is not proofable, meaning you know, there are no polynomial algorithms that can get the cross entropy that you get in the experiment. Whereas if you are in the strong noise regime, uh, well, cross entropy does not estimate fidelity, because local correlations dominate, and uh, you know polynomial classical algorithms kind of spoof your your cross entropy. So uh, quickly, I will cover um, some other experiments which are not in our systems, which are superconducting qubits. Here is a, a recent experiment, sort of similar ideas, but this is an analog evolution on Rydberg quantum simulators uh, by the, at the group and Manuel Andres. Uh, so we heard you know about neutral atoms, and there has been a lot of progress recently. So in this particular experiment, um, they do a similar thing, but it's, that's the Hamiltonian, the Rydberg uh, neutral atom Hamiltonian, and they just evolve, uh, so it's analog, it's not digital, uh, but they do similar ideas for entropy benchmarking to measure the fidelity of the system. Up to some point, then the classical simulation becomes expensive, although they can still do it, uh, and anyway, and, and you see actually this, the fidelity first decreases exponentially, then it decreases a bit slower because clear errors kind of dominate and it has a different behavior than discrete models. So this is interesting comparison point. Uh, they actually introduce in this paper as well a different kind of measure. This is not computational cost, but it's a way to compare experiments. I think part of the reason is that in, in the analog case, you know, in the, in, the, in the digital case, I can give you a formal definition of computational cost, which is just tensor contraction. In the analog case, it's more complicated. You have to worry about authorizations and, and things like that. So um, anyway. So they introduced this other measure, which is, they call mixed state entanglement, and you see that in, in this particular experiment, uh, you know, it kind of corresponds uh, more or less, I guess, to, to the computational cost. I don't know how this compares quite with the uh, new experiment that Misha presented yesterday. I guess we'll find out soon. Um, another experiment sort of in the same vein, but a different platform is Gaussian Boson sampling. This one is harder uh, because you cannot even measure fidelity in this case, so you're walking on thin ice, I guess. And uh, what I'm gonna say is uh, actually, uh, Magic mentioned these kind of experiments, and he said, well, I don't know what paper simulates them. Well, here is the paper. And what they basically do in a nutshell is they, these are experiments with many photons, up to 150 photons. Uh, it's, you know, it's just showing Gaussian light through um, the, you know, interferometer with a squeezing, of course. And, um, but you know, there is noise, and is, you know, which normally you measure with fidelity in this system, you cannot measure fidelity, so it's not clear how you deal with noise. So what they do that uh, in this particular paper, they find a way to sort of take, sort of in, in, in the top of the picture on the left, you see what the renal experiment was. They kind of, uh, in the bottom diagram, what they're supposed to convey is the idea that you can separate it into squeeze states without noise, but less photons, and then you put the noise after that. And what is classically hard to simulate is just the squeeze states, which not have noise, but they have less photons. And in the table on the, you know, on the right, you see that the 150 photons let's say, that you get in some of these experiments can be, using this particular new technique, uh, converted into just 10 photons that then you can simulate. Um, OK. So that's um, kind of about uh, this particular you know, way of benchmarking systems. Um, so of course, what we will want to do is applications. So random circle sampling is a benchmark, but it's not, let's say, you know, a basic application per se. Um, so I will start by saying that, you know, I think there are applications in what we call NIST, so before doing error corrections, but I think they are, as other people mentioned before, scientific applications, right? So mostly, you know, okay, random circuits, 
Um, maybe you can do certified randomness. I think uh, Ignacio is gonna talk about that maybe in some sense. Uh, auto, we can certainly do, uh, maybe it relates to quantum gravity, but you can do spin models, things like that. Perhaps fermionic simulation, but that's gonna be hard with superconducting qubits. That was mentioned before as well, because you know we don't have fermions. I don't think we are able to do classical machine learning or classical optimization because classical computers are just very good. So I'm, you know, kind of pessimistic we're going to be able to do much in that from in that area uh, without error correction. So in the context of these applications, um, you know, I like trying to benchmark and measure things. So we're, you know, we've been thinking about how to benchmark uh, kind of NISC applications for a while, and um, this is related to the talk by Oliver Dial this uh, today. Um, so in a nutshell, what I will say is that it's important if you have an observable that you have a finite butterfly velocity that uh, you can actually measure with auto, uh, with out of time order correlators. And then what you need to do if you want to kind of uh, estimate classically the value of that observable is just simulate the gates within sort of your butterfly, right? Not the whole circuit, just the butterfly con. And then uh, the computational cost, so those are not all the gates. The computational cost, thinking in tensor contraction kind of terms, will scale with the area, not the volume of it. So the fidelity decreases exponentially in the volume. So if you have a good fidelity uh, without even doing error mitigation, that probably means you don't have a large butterfly cone. And then the cost will be proportional to the area. So the numbers there tells you, you know, how, I don't know, uh, auto we did in 21 compressed with random circle sampling to the uh, paper that was mentioned this morning uh, in terms of the computational cost. So uh, nevertheless, even if you're not um, you know, in the regime that you cannot simulate this classically uh, in these experiments yet, well, you can do a lot of interesting science and experiments. So these are some of the papers that our group does. Uh, uh, but of course, you know, everybody here has been doing a lot of interesting science as well. And then in the last couple of minutes, I will just mention quickly our second milestone, uh, which is a logical qubit prototype. So what I, we mean by a logical qubit prototype is very simply the concept that we increase the code distance, in this case, of a surface code. And uh, as we increase the code distance, and we do many error correction rounds, uh, the failure probability, the logical uh, error rate per cycle, should decrease. Um, and the factor by which the error decreases is what we call lambda. OK, so we actually did this experiment um, uh, this, this year. And what we see um, is that as we move from distance five to distance three, uh, which you can see in the plots on the right, uh, I guess, let's see, distance uh, five is blue, distance three is red. You can see the logical error probability is actually lower. And you can fit this you know, to an exponential decay over many rounds. And, and we find that you know, as we move from distance three to distance five, the error decreases by between you know, three to 4%. So then we're happy we, you know, that's why we say it's a, it's, it's a logical qubit prototype. So, you know, error correction is working, logical errors are decreasing, not fast enough to actually build a quantum computer, but it's sort of a fast step to get there. One point I will make that came out yesterday as well, when we were discussing some of the nice experiments from Misha, is that uh, to do this measure, this lambda, you have to do it over many rounds. If you only look at the first round, uh, because the reasons what Misha was explaining, there are no errors in the syndrome measurements, in this particular case, you will think that your error is decreasing by 100, so lambda will be two. But if you then do, do many measurements, uh, you know, many cycles, then you know, uh, errors accumulate, and you have errors in the syndrome measurement, and it was only like a 4% error. And uh, with that, I will conclude here. Thank you. <laughs>